prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we gather here for the power of the Spirit, uh, the energy that comes forth from our sacramental life as, as a people of God, especially being mindful of all those things that we have that enrich our spiritual life, that connects us with the heavenly kingdom and guides us along this earthly journey. We pray that everything that we reflect upon and pray for will truly go before God's throne in order that we may receive the graces and blessings that have guided us so far in our life. As we continue on into the future, we accept the unknown in God's trust and loving care, and we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm also going to start off with a biblical reading from the Holy Bible that's kind of pertinent to what we're talking about today in a very concrete spiritual way. Uh, it's from the letter uh, from, to Ephesians, and it's chapter 6. And it goes um, from uh, verse uh, 10 all the way through 17. Um, and so anyway, basically it goes like this. It says, Finally, draw your strength from the Lord and from his mighty power. Put on the armor of God, so that you may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. For our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness, with the evil spirits in the heavens. Therefore, put on the armor of God, that you may be able to resist on the evil day, and having done everything, to hold your ground. So stand fast with your loins girded in truth, glowed with righteousness as a breastplate, and put your feet shod in readiness for the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, hold faith as a shield to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this is the Word of God. Amen. The words in this are very pertinent to what we're going to be talking about. It talks about having the armor of God. It talks about the whole sense of the shield, the whole sense of everything that has to do with holding our ground. And it's all about a very strong sense of being protected. And so these, these physical things like a shield and like armor, you know, and, and everything that goes into the sense of the, of the helmet, these are all protective things, okay? Well, we can apply that to our sacramental life, our sacramentals, like medals, scapulars, all the different physical things that tell us something about our faith. Now, we as Catholics have a dimension to our faith that's called the mystical, okay? And so when we talk about what's mystical, we're talking about a connection between the material world and the immaterial world. We would talk about it as a connection between the material world and the spiritual world. When you talk about holy water, okay, some people are going to say, well, it's just water. You know, it's, it's, it's symbolic of something. It's a symbol. The human being, the so-called, as scientists might say, the human animal, Animal, you know, is a symbol maker. Well, that's very anthropological and sociological, don't you think? For the highly educated, you know, college education of advanced studies in human nature, okay? And they leave it at that. But we as Catholics believe that that whole sense of, say, for example, holy water is a connection between the material world and the immaterial world because our souls are connected with the immaterial world. Because there, it's not, the soul is immaterial. But if you 
are interested in physics, okay? If you keep reducing things to the smallest bottom level of existence and creation, it eventually becomes immaterial. It becomes pure energy. And then beyond that, we certainly believe, you know, in the divine, you know, where God exists, you know, in all places, all times, and so on. So we got to talk about, you know, the brown scapular. Because the brown scapular has a very direct statement on it. And so it's differentiated from all other scapulars. Because all other scapulars, you know, will have a prayer, which is good, okay, and so on and so forth. The brown scapular is unique in the sense that it has a promise written on it, okay. Now, you're supposed to wear the scapular, the brown scapular, around your neck, okay? That's traditional, okay? Now me, I can't stand rings on my fingers, and I can hardly stand anything on my neck, you know? <laughs> so I don't have medals and stuff. So where do I keep my brown scapular? In my wallet. And it's been there for years, you know, it's in there with everything else, my credit card, you know, with a little money I have, you know, it's, it's kind of tucked away in there, okay? So, so this is what we're talking about. We're talking about something that is deeply spiritual, and we're also talking about things that are protective of us in terms of what is given to us specifically for our enlightenment and raising our minds to God in everything that we have in our faith. And so, taking that into account, I'm going to give some background. First of all, I'm going to, you know, talk about that whole sense of, of the connection between the, the material world and the immaterial world. I'm going to talk about sacramentals, of course, you know. One of the early church fathers said this early on, okay? Do not then believe only what the eyes of your body tell you. What is not seen is here more truly seen. For what is seen belongs to time, but what is not seen belongs to eternity. What is not comprehended by the eyes, but is seen by the mind and the soul, is seen in a truer and deeper sense. There's nothing more Catholic than that, and that's the early church fathers, okay? Uh, and so, when we think about that, we're living in time. Remember, there's no time with God. And that's kind of hard to comprehend, you know, because, you know, I always got my watch. I'm so time conscious, as we all are to a certain degree, okay? But when we're talking about eternity, we're talking about the mind, you know, prayer in the mind, what we call discursive prayer in the mind, but the nature of the soul. You know, what, what is the nature of the soul? Now, we believe that the soul is really the source of life. You know, some people are going to say, well, it's the heart. You know, they're going to say, well, it's your brain. It's all in your brain. If you've ever seen a brain, it ain't much to look at, okay? So the thing is, we as a people of faith believe that what animates us what really gives life to every single creature, whether it's a plant, an animal, a vegetable, a human being, is that everything has a soul with its particular nature. And so when we think about sacramentals, and we think about, say for example, the miraculous metal, or any of the number of different scapulars, we're talking about something that's very definitely physical, but also connected deeply with the immaterial and connected with the soul. Okay? So now, our Lady of Mount Carmel. Here we go. The feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel is tomorrow, July the 16th. The feast commemorates 18 various scapular devotions, including the brown scapular. So tomorrow is a celebration of the value of the scapular in our faith. Now, the 13th century, the 13th century was a wonderful time to be Catholic. The 13th century. We're going to talk about the 16th century, but we're not going to go there yet. Okay, the 13th century was known as the age of faith. 
There was harmony in the church. There were a lot of, you know, great saints coming forth from the 13th century. It was a blessed time. And so the Carmelite saint, and you may have heard of his name, Simon Stock, asked Mary to grant a special privilege to his order. And that's where it began. The whole thing began there. On a certain day, in time, on a certain day, the Blessed Virgin appeared to him with a brown scapular. And we got the Blessed Mother's got a brown scapular. It's like a material thing, right? And so, the brown scapular in her hand, saying, this is what she said. Here is the privilege I grant to you and to all children of Carmel. Whoever dies clothed in this habit shall be saved. That's a promise. Okay, it's a promise. Now, when you think about that, and you think about valuing the sacramentals, Valuing the sacramental, particularly the brown scapular, okay, we're talking about something that's deeply connected to the soul. But it's a, it's a material object, obviously. But it's saying something about the condition of your soul. It's saying something about what you believe. Even in the midst of all your faults and failings, you're identifying with something that says something. And that's, of course, the brown scapular. Now, this is the traditional prayer of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the traditional prayer. O oh, beautiful flower of Carmel, most fruitful vine and splendor of heaven, O oh, holy and singular one, who brought forth the only Son of God, while remaining still a pure virgin, watch over us this night, O star of the sea, O mother of Christ, show us you are our mother too. And that's a very, very beautiful prayer. And that is, of course, the traditional prayer of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Okay? Now, a little historical information that adds some clarity to everything. Where is Mount Carmel? Okay. Huh? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Go for you. Okay, here you go. Yeah, it's a mountain projecting into the Mediterranean Sea along the coast of Palestine near the present day city of Haifa. Okay. I've never been there. Has anybody ever been there? Oh, well. But they say it's beautiful. The Mediterranean's beautiful. Uh, I've seen the Mediterranean, it's so beautifully blue. I went to Italy once, Capri, Ischia, where my grandfather's from, you know. The beautiful blue grotto of Capri and everything. The blue Mediterranean, beautiful. It's not gray like the Atlantic. <laughs> you know, being from Philadelphia, we go down the shore, right? And there, there's the, the ocean, the, the, the Atlantic Ocean, right? And it's like, man, it's like really gray, you know? It's really gray. It's kind of a dull color, you know? I, I think the Pacific is bluer, is it not? Anybody seen the Pacific? Oh, yeah. Is it bluer? Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> it's bluer. Well, that's, that's neither here nor there, but it's interesting nonetheless. Okay, so anyway, it was here that Elijah defied the hundreds of pagan prophets in the presence of King Ahab, who was a nasty guy, if you read the Bible, okay, and proved to the people that Yahweh was the true God. Goes way, way back, right? Elijah. That's 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 to 40, if you ever want to read it. It's very dramatic. It's very dramatic. Okay, now, let's talk about the Carmelite order, okay? The, the wonderful Carmelite order. <clears throat> it was founded in Palestine by St. Berthold uh, around 1154. That's a long time ago, 1154. He passed away in 1195, okay? So it, it, it was started or founded in 1154. Now, it has a claim. <clears throat> it claims continuity 
with the hermits on Mount Carmel from ancient times and even to the prophet Elijah. So there were always hermits living there, you know, people who devoted their whole life to prayer and solitude, you know. Some people could do that, I guess, you know. And so anyway, that is something, that, can you imagine, you know, imagine that somebody living in solitude, devoting all their time to prayer, okay? Now, that's an interesting way of life. And there are some Christians that would say, that's a total waste of time. But we as Catholics, you know, we got this thing that the mystical, that this is the thing, the mystical, you know, some of the other denominations have completely eradicated mysticism and the mystical, you know, because they, they don't have particular saints, you know, whereas we, of course, as Catholics, have, have saints, you know, and, and a lot of them are mystics. Like, say, for example, Teresa of Avila was a mystic, okay, and we'll get into that a little bit, uh, too. And so, anyway, now, continuing with this, the, um, it, it developed, the Carmelite order was developing, the original rule was set down in 1209 by the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, and his name was Albert of Vercelli. Sounds like an Italian name, you know, Vercelli. Albert of Vercelli, and he lived from 1149 to 1214. So he developed or concretized the order of life for the Carmelites, and it was very severe. In the beginning, it was very severe. It prescribed absolute poverty, total abstinence from meat and solitude. Now, who can live like that? You know. Well, they did. It was pretty severe. But you know, when someone lives like that, detached from the world, something happens to the soul. Okay, we really strongly believe that. Because the mystical saints tell us this. Something happens to the nature of the soul. Because if we believe that life comes from the soul that animates everything, then there's going to be a transformation. And a lot of the mystical saints tell us about that, that transformation. So, after the Crusades, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the Crusades, you know, because that's a, an arduous historical journey, you know, of terrible conflict. But after the Crusades, the Englishman, this is where St. Simon Stock comes in. Because he wasn't, you know, at the very beginning or anything like that. So after the Crusades, the Englishman Saint Simon Stock, he died in 1265, reorganized the Carmelites as, a, as mendicant friars. Mendicant friars. Which means they geared most of their prayer life towards penance. Doing penance. Not only for themselves, but doing penance for sinners. Okay, there's a lot of sinners in the world. We may have met some. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> good. You know, so anyway, okay, so they were mendicants, you know, praying for the salvation of souls for God's sake. That's what the church is all about. That's the only reason why the church exists is for the salvation of souls. Okay, so now, then we get into the 16th century. I'm going to have to get into it a little bit. Things got a little crazy in the 16th century, I'll tell you. You know, you think this time is bad. Partying, drinking drugs, alcohol, the 60s and the 70s, and all the, you know, the decline and everything that we're saying, oh, this is the worst time in the whole history of the world. <laughs> they, they, well, man, if you lived in the 16th century, you were thinking you were living in the 21st century. Is this 21st century? <laughs> it was really wild back then, you know? And so the laxity of the 16th century brought reforms among the women. The women needed to be reformed. Of course, they get to be a little saucy, if you know what I'm talking about. Well, maybe you don't. But anyway, you know. And so who did that? Okay, who brought the reforms into the, the Carmelite, you know, uh, women in the 16th century? St. Teresa of Avila. And she was opposed, too, because there are some people that really wanted to continue to party. You know, he, she wanted to put the kibosh on that. So anyway, okay, so St. Teresa of Avila from 1515 to, to, you know, 1582, okay. Well, what about the men? Well, they needed to be reformed too, okay. 
So the men were reformed under St. John of the Cross. Okay, and he lived from 1542 to, to 1591. Okay, it was an era of laxity. Okay, it was an era of kind of prosperity in the sense that, you know, it was a time when people could say, hey, let's have a good time. That happens every so often. You know? Now, let's take, for example, the Roaring Twenties. Why was there the Roaring Twenties? Because that was a pretty wild time, too, historically. You have the flappers, okay, then you got prohibition, you got, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the reason why is because, you know, after World War I, where there was so much horror in the world, everybody said, hey, let's have a good time, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you may be killed in a war, you know. So it's interesting how these things play out over the centuries. And so this, you know, history repeats itself, and let's face that. Human, you know, one of the great spiritual directors in my seminary formation, you know, Father Ray Galvin, he said, Mike, if there's one, we told, he told all of us this, he said, guys, one thing you need to remember, as you go on in your priesthood, you're gonna see a lot of changes in the world. There's gonna be a lot of changes. Like, take a look at the changes now. You know, because this was back like in the 70s, right? All the changes going on. He said, one thing to remember, human nature never changes. Yeah. And that's the truth. Human nature never changes. That's pretty interesting. Technology changes, yeah. Human nature doesn't. Okay, so now, this is what happened with the reforms. There were some who didn't want to reform. There are some who wanted to reform. Okay, this created the two independent branches of the order. The Kaust, or Shod, Carmelites, of the old observance. Then there is, and the Diskaust, or the Unshod, <laughs> following the Teresian reform. Okay, so you got two groups here. Okay, all right, regardless of what group it is, actually, it all came down to footwear. Okay, because if you're Shod, you're wearing a, a shoe. If you're unshod, you ain't wearing no shoe. So <laughs> the difference between these two groups, you know. Uh, but anyway, so going on with taking a look at that, overall, what's the purpose of the Carmelites? Why do they exist? Okay. The purpose of the Carmelite order, contemplation, missionary work, and theology. Because Teresa of Avila was, was uh, a theologian, obviously. She wrote that book, Interior Castle. Anybody ever read Interior Castle by, by Teresa of Avila? It's a very interesting book. It talks about the stages of the spiritual life. Okay, and then we have, you know, uh, the little flower, uh, Le Soeur. Okay, very simple girl. You know, matter of fact, you know, um, Teresa of Avila was a mystic. She had visions and everything, okay? The little flower, she never had any visions. <laughs> <laughs> she was just a pure soul, okay? But she's, just, she's been established as a doctor of the church. She talks about the little way. Well, that's pretty doggone humble, if you think about it. She never went anywhere, you know? So, and you could say, well, she never did anything. But that's, but that's not the point. The point is, what did she do? She prayed. And for some people, that's enough, you know? Okay, now, the Carmelite nuns devote themselves to prayer, especially of intercession for priests. Oh, priests need prayer. Priests pray for the priests. They need prayers. We all need prayers. Well, we all need prayers. But priests, man, you know, we're seeing a lot of stuff going out in people's lives. I mean, you know, you, you, we have this access or sense of people telling us what's going on in their lives. And I'm telling you, man, some people are really struggling. You know, especially families nowadays. I would say families are really struggling, you know. Uh, so anyway, intercession for priests and to a life of hidden sacrifice. Okay. If you make a sacrifice, are you to brag about it? <laughs> I made so many sacrifices today. In one day, I did 10 sacrifices. Are you going to go out and brag about that? <laughs> you know? Well, maybe, you know. You might still get credit for it, but, you know. So the thing is a hidden sacrifice. Nobody knows that you sacrifice but God and you. That's pretty neat, you know, when you think about it. Okay. And here we go. We're going to talk about the most famous Carmel Carmelite. The most famous was St. Teresa of Lisieux. 
I think that's the way you say that, le sir. Right? Um, t I took French in high school, it was terrible. You know, so anyway, yeah, gosh. The, con the, colonization, uh, the canonization of St. Teresa le sir, she lived from 1873 to uh, 1897, very short life, very short life. <clears throat> okay, in 1925, she was canonized. And her designation as patroness of the missions have done much to make the Carmelites, the Carmelite ideal, known and imitated throughout the Catholic world. Of all the Carmelites, she's the best known. Okay? Teresa of Avila is the other one. John of the Cross, too. But there's something about the little flower. Did you ever see a picture of her? God, she's like a little girl, you know? I mean, she's, you know, like so innocent. You know, it's just a kind of amazing thing, you know? Okay, now, this, I'm going to get into a little bit of definition between the, the people who, who are wearing shoes and the people who aren't wearing shoes. Okay, now, decalced means barefooted. Okay, it's, 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 a tie, it's a term applied to religious congregations of men and women who are unshod or wear sandals. Well, you've got to wear something, right? I mean, you can't go barefoot all the time. So they wear sandals, you know? They wear sandals. Okay, a lot of people feel comfortable with sandals okay, instead of a shoe. Okay, so now, the ones who wear sandals, who have picked up on that way of being humble and simple, the Dessalus Carmelites, the Augustinians, and the clerks of the Holy Cross. Okay, they took on the sandal wearing. Okay, well, it spread. It was introduced into the West by St. Francis. St. Francis wore sandals. Now, how many here uh, do know Father, Father uh, Dave Knight? Father Dave Knight, okay. Did you notice he always wore sandals? Did you notice that? <laughs> that, was kind of, that was kind of like his calling card, you know, his sandals. That's good, okay. And St. Clair, okay, St. Clair, as a form of austerity. It's austere, okay, it's austere. All right, now, let's go more specifically into the scapular, okay. We'll get into the scapular here. All right. Now, what is a scapular? Okay, the simple definition of a scapular is this. The outer garment consisting of two strips of cloth joined across the shoulders worn by members of certain religious orders. It's the full thing. Okay, the full, what do you call it? Habit, you know. All right, now. It originated... The whole thing about, you know, the, the, the scapular, okay, or, or this garment, it originated as the working frock of the Benedictines. That's where it began. The Benedictines, you know, they wear that, you know, whatever, um, whatever you want to call it, you know, thing. Because I, I t took my last year of seminary at St. Meinrad in Indiana, and, and, and the monks wore that. It looked very uncomfortable to me, but anyway, you know, and it's black. That's their color. It was the black for the, for the Benedictines. It was adopted by other religious communities as a distinctive part of the monastic habit. It's the monastic habit, okay? Was somewhat, what, somewhat characteristic of the monastic orders is the cassock, okay? You oftentimes see a priest wears a cassock, okay? Well, you know, they're not monks, but it's reminiscent of that, that same kind of, of garment. It's it really, you know, basically a garment that signifies somebody who prays, okay? Um, so, you know, the, the cassock. I, 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 cassock is very, you know, when I said the Latin mass, okay, um, I actually said the Tridentine old Latin mass rite, which is a miracle, you know? Um, I enjoyed it, to tell you the truth. I liked it. Um, we were, we were a cassock, okay? The cassock was very characteristic of that. And the Beretta. That's a cool hat. I like the Beretta. It's got a little pom-pom on the top and everything, you know? It's kind of cool. Of <laughs> course, you know, it's funny, but the Latin Mass, you know, the priest comes up the center aisle, right? The server's there, and he goes, he takes it. It's got the three horns. You go like this. And the server takes it, you know? <laughs> you go up, and then on the way out, the server's got your, your, your Beretta. And you, you put it on, and you walk out. It was really cool. I liked it. I enjoyed it. <laughs> it was something. Okay, now, what does it symbolize? Okay, it symbolizes the yoke of Christ. Symbolizes the yoke of Christ. A scapular is worn under one's secular clothes. Now, this is the, the tertiaries, okay? 
in an abbreviated form of tertiaries associated with the religious orders. You know, is, is there anybody here who's a, 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 a tertiary um, um, Carmelite? Carmelite of the third order? Okay, all right, yeah, okay. Um, but they, are, they, they exist in the, in the diocese, you know, they exist in the diocese. Uh, and they go through a kind of an indoctrination and, and of course, you know, and, and so on. Uh, but they live in the secular world, okay. Now I'll talk a little bit about the tertiaries. Lay persons living in the world who are striving after Christian perfection as their station in life allows. Well, that's pretty good. You know, try to do that. It ain't easy, you know, because the secular world's got so much stuff, you know. So anyway, living according to the spirit of a religious order to which they are affiliated. Well, there's a, there's a third, third order Franciscan, Franciscans. Anybody here third order Franciscan? No? Okay. All right. Well, they, 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 I think they exist in the diocese too, I think. I think they do, yeah. Okay. They abide by the rules approved for the association by the apostolic see. Now, we all know what the apostolic see is, right? That's Rome. That's the, you know, that's the Pope, the apostolic see. Okay. They share in the good works of their parent order, which is the formal Carmelite order. Okay. Tertiary scapulars vary in size and shape. Their color corresponds to that of the monastic family. It's brown, right? It's brown. Carmelite's brown. Okay. The church has approved some 18 blessed scapulars. There's like 18 scapulars. That's a lot of scapulars, you know. And these are the, the, the most common are five scapulars. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which is brown, okay. The Passion, which is red. The seven dollars, which is black. The Immaculate Conception, which is obviously blue. Okay. The Holy Trinity, which is white. Now we all know the Dominicans, right? Did you ever see the Dominicans dressed up in their, in their, their, their habit? Yeah. What color is it? White and black. Oh, right. There you go. Yeah, white and black. Yeah, so anyway. Yeah, so, so you know, every order's got its own, you know, color, so to speak. Okay, now... Now there's the green scapular. You know, the green scapular is a little bit different. Okay, the green scapular is the badge of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Okay. Now, it's a devotional article approved by Pope Pius in 1870. Okay, the green scapular. All right. It is not descended from the scapulars that form part of the habit worn by religious orders. In other words, no religious order that's associated with the green scapular. It's just sort of like a medal, you know, it's, it's the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So anyway, that's to, to give you a differentiation. Um, and so anyway, uh, when, when we talk about this whole sense of the brown scapular, or our Lady of Mount Carmel, and what it specifically says is, is, is very profound. Whoever dies wearing this scapular shall not suffer eternal life. Okay. Uh, well, that's a promise. Okay. Our, our, our Lady Scapular promise. Now, now look, let's look at it this way. I'm a terrible sinner. And I love to sin. It's just a lot of fun. I can't give it up. I've tried. But if I got this scapular, man, I can sin all I want. But as long as I got this around my neck, maybe, I got it made. Now, who would believe that? You know? I mean, it's like... Theoretically, there might be somebody like that, right? But generally, you would think that there wouldn't be somebody that dense, okay? And I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but I don't think I ever met somebody like that. But anyway, um, so obviously, you know, it says something about you. It says something about what you believe. And it should say something about the condition of your soul. Because we all want to die in a state of grace, right? Okay, so that's it. It's important to realize that, obviously. Okay, now, Simon Stock, who was this guy? Okay, who was Simon Stock? Okay, well, let's talk a little about, about who he was. Okay, Simon Stock, he was, a very, he was very spiritual as a child. He was very spiritual as a child. You know, when I was a little guy, I went to, of course, I went to Catholic school. I must have been about seven or whatever. I said mass 
okay? My little brother, you know, he was attending mass. I'd set up a table and I'd get a, gla I don't know, a glass or whatever, I'd get something. And I'd take a piece of bread, okay, and I'd take my dad's shot glass and I would... <laughs> <laughs> I, I cut out these hosts on the bread, you know? And I'm like, my little brother's like, you know. <laughs> and I don't know what I said. It must have been some facsimile of Latin or whatever, whatever it was. I did the whole thing, you know, and I give my brother, because back then, you know, you receive on the tongue. There was no hand, right? So my brother would go. <laughs> he was three years younger than me, so he was, he was my, I don't know if that says anything about me, but my mother told me years later, you know, uh, that, you know, it's the Irish tradition. You, put, you devote your firstborn to God, right? My mother told me the story. She said, this is years later. You know, she said, yeah, Mike, when you were born, after you were baptized, I went over to the altar at St. Anthony Church in South Philadelphia. I put you on the altar. And I said, here he is, Lord. He's all yours. And she said something like that, you know? So I guess it kind of came true. God bless her. God bless my mother. She was the spiritual anchor of my family. She saved my father. <laughs> Well, there's two sides of my family. Some are Assembly of God and some are Catholic, but that was interesting. But anyway, so my mother, my father brought my, my mother brought my father to the church, you know. And we went, to, we went to Mass every Sunday. We were a very, you know, typical Catholic family. On Sundays, what we would, not on Sundays, but uh, each kid was assigned to have the Statue of Mary for a week. And so the family had to say the rosary every day in the evening. We did that. And I remember over there, yeah, my brother and I went like this, and there's Mary's statue, and say the rosary, you know. That was the Catholic era, I guess. We're talking about the 50s. Woo, that's a long time ago. Okay, well, anyway, that's neither here nor there, but it's interesting nonetheless. Okay, so now, all right, he was a very spiritual child. Prayerful. He entered the Carmelite order in England. In 1247, he, ele he was elected the sixth general of the Carmelites. The sixth general. He showed remarkable energy. I guess that was kind of important. You know, he was a very energetic guy, okay? And is the most celebrated of all of its generals, okay? However, now that this is interesting about the Catholic Church, okay? We need to understand this. You know, sometimes don't, things don't go too smooth, okay? And so what happened was originally they were oppressed by the other orders. The other orders did not want them to exist. That's kind of weird, isn't it? But, I mean, it did happen. You know, I don't know whether it was because of vested interest or whatever was going on there. But, but they were oppressed, you know, uh, by the other orders and the secular clergy. Because <laughs> I'm a secular priest, right? So I guess they weren't in favor of it for some reason. I don't know. But anyway. <clears throat> and so, what did the monks do? What did the monks do? The monks prayed to their patroness, the Blessed Virgin. They pray. What are you going to do? You going to go to war with these guys? The other people? You going to defend the fort? Put up the, you know, the, the got the swords and everything? No, it's like, well, we're going to pray. That's our, that's our weapon. Prayer is our weapon. So Mary revealed to Saint Simon to ask Pope Innocent for help. Mary's telling Simon, you know, not only the whole thing about the scapular and, and what is said, but she's telling him to go to the Pope, you know? And so anyway, so, you know, she revealed to Simon to ask Pope Innocent for help. Well, that's a pretty good directive. You know, it's just like St. Francis. St. Francis was a nobody. How did he end up having a meeting with the Pope? It was a miracle. It was God's will. You know, in one of the movies I watched years ago, um, it shows Saint, there's guards all in front of the papacy, you know, guards and everything with the big spear guys, the Swiss, Swiss people the Swiss guards and everything. And so anyway, St. Francis is coming up there. He's got sandals. He's got his like brown habit and everything. And so he, he goes up there, waits a little while. The guards go to the side as they change the guard. He goes right through the center. <laughs> I didn't even, didn't even see him, you know? Because I was in the movie. It had to happen some miraculous way, you know? So anyway, okay, so now. Mary, okay, that's what Mary revealed to Simon to ask the Pope. As a result, the order received a bull or letter of protection from Pope Innocent. That was pretty cool, you know? And that was on January the 13th, 1252. God, 1252, that's a long time ago. Okay. But this was part of the provision, part of the previous vision. Okay, so this was part of the vision as a whole. Mary, in appearing to Simon with the scapular of the order in her hand, with these words, 
I'm going to say it in Latin because I just hoc et tibi et cunctis carmenilitis provireum in hoc habitu moriens salvitoribi. Burr. I guess. It, this is what it means. I just wanted to show off a little, you know, a little bit of my Latin, you know. <laughs> show off a little. Okay. But this is what it is in English. Okay. This shall be the privilege for you and for all the Carmelites that anyone dying in this habit shall be saved. Wow, man, that's pretty nice. You know, I like that. Okay. Now, this is the, where the tradition developed to the current time. Okay. A tradition developed that the small scapular version was given to benefactors and friends. Okay, so the Carmelites, you know, like with different people who supported the church and so on and so forth, the little scapular was designed originally as a thank you sort of thing, okay, for, for benefactors and for friends. Okay, well, it's kind of a nice thing. But it went a little bit more spiritual as time went on. It wasn't just a little memento for us, for helping us, okay. Um, and so the third order developed as a sign of Carmelite spiritual unity. And this is where you have the tertiaries, the third order. And what do they do? This is what the third order does. Contemplation, missionary work, whatever that may be, theology, intercession for priests, and a life of interior hidden sacrifice. And so you can do this in the lay world. The tertiaries do this, you know, you know they have a job or whatever, but they, they do this as part of their spiritual underpinning, you know, in terms of their life. Okay. Now, Taking all that into account, I'm, I'm going to touch a little bit, you know, um, uh, am I doing all right in time here? Three minutes. Okay, well, that's fine. That's fine, because I think I'm, I'm about done, really. Oh, perfect time. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about sacramentals. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about sacramentals. You know, Catholics are really criticized for sacramentals. You all got them statues, you idol worshipers. You know, and you all think Mary's God. That, doesn't that just burn you up? Doesn't it? Or that, well, you know, but you've got to be charitable. Oh, no, no, you see, you misunderstand. <laughs> you know, and you want to kind of get a little bit rougher and say, yeah, I know nothing. The Reformation, Martin Luther, all you guys, you know, you know, threw everything out. What do you got? You got songs and, and, and some guy that preaches. It, I'm sorry. I don't mean that in a drug. I have, well, you know, part of my family is Assembly of God. I love them. You know, my, my uncle used to preach and I used to jump up and down with him, you know, when we go to his church. And so I, I love the Protestants. You know, I love them very much. Okay. So anyway, but I'm sure, you know, they kind of joke around with us a little bit. Okay. So anyway, sacramentals, religious objects, and veneration. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Okay. The connection between material objects and the world of the spirit. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, we're talking about religion. You know, when you talk about the concrete world, okay, I, I've delved in a little bit over the past year or so into into physics. Uh, some friends of mine, uh, their son is a genius. He just graduated from um, Rensselaer University in, in nuclear physics. He's working for the government. As a matter of fact, he just started a job in Maryland, you know, for the the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and. Um, he wrote this paper, his father showed me this, his paper, his thesis, it was like, <laughs> you know? I couldn't understand the word, it was all mathematical and everything, you know? Uh, and he actually got praised for it because he, he's innovative, he, he's developing ways to protect devices in space from radiation. Yeah, you know, it's pretty cool. Okay, if you ever go out into space, you'll be protected. Your watch will be protected. And so anyway. So the thing is, when you, when you think about, you know, the, the connection between the material objects and the world of the spirit, or the immaterial world, okay, it's, it's pretty fascinating, it's pretty fascinating. So the immaterial world, what we call the immaterial world, which is the things that we don't see, let's put it that way, things that aren't concrete like this, things that get down into mo mo molecules, atoms, neutrons, protons, you know, that, they should be, now, now they're getting into like even smaller stuff like a quark, a quark. I don't even know what that is, but it's a smaller thing. Then they got these bosons, and they're getting into these bosons. How small can you get? You know, if you keep getting smaller, where do you end up? <laughs> you know, it's kind of an interesting thought, you know, anyway. If you keep going out into space, where do you end up? If you keep going, where do you end up? This is food for thought, okay. 
Okay, here we go. All right, now. The immaterial world and the effect of the internal world of human beings having immortal souls and the external world, okay, the nature of the soul. And we talk about, you know, what is the soul, okay? Now, when you see a connection between the material world, okay, and the immaterial world, what we call the spiritual world, what do you get? What kind of manifestations did you, do you get? These are the manifestations, and we're all familiar with them. The stigmata. <laughs> There's really no definite conclusion about what that is, scientifically, or even empirically. You know. um, so there you go. You know, that's an example of the contact of material world in contact with the spiritual world, or the immaterial world. Okay? Weeping Madonnas. You know. I, I guess that's true. I mean, I, I don't know. I've heard about it, you know, the weeping Madonna, okay? Uh, prophecies. Prophecies. You know, some people are very prophetic, you know. And of course, what do we have? We have Lourdes and Fatima. Is that not a connection between the material world and the spiritual world? Obviously it is, you know. But the Blessed Mother was physically seen. We're not going to ever really know what material nature she was in her appearance, but she was seen. So we think about that, you know, and we ponder about that. Okay, so some of the other things, um, like say, for example, miraculous physical cures. Someone who was miraculously, you know, cured, and we've, we've heard about these things, you know. Um, who, Fa Father Diorio, did anybody ever hear about Father Diorio? Father Diorio was a healing priest. He had a special gift of prayer, and there's some verification that people that he prayed for or had contact with or laid hands on were cured of a disease. You know, I mean, of course, you hear about this, it doesn't get a lot of publicity because, you know, not a lot of the secular world wants to promote religion, especially Catholicism of all, you know. So, uh, so anyway, okay. Um, heavenly warnings. You know, heavenly warnings. I mean, you know, it, it's like, well, obviously the Blessed Mother predicted at Fatima World War II. You know, so it's like, you know, uh, and then we have the whole sense of the influence of Satan and evil, you know, the existence of demons, you know, possessions. And, and I've run into this, not frequently, thank God, but I've run into some very strange things uh, as a priest that... Um, whether it was blessing a house or, or a person who... I, I wouldn't say the person was possessed. I, I wouldn't say that. But there are some people who experience spiritual turbulence of a spiritual nature. Okay. The only way you deal with that is prayer. Matter of fact, there's a book that came out recently in the past five years. It's called Minor Exorcism for Priests. It's a really interesting prayer book. Uh, there are certain minor exorcisms or prayers that you can say for people that have to deal with spiritual turbulence. But now possession is a different matter. Okay, because if a person is generally possessed, the bishop needs to handle that. Every diocese and archdiocese has an exorcist, a formal, formally assigned priest is an exorcist. And nobody's supposed to know who that is. And if there ever is a genuine possession it's never to be made public. It needs to be private within the context of the family and the church through the priest and the bishop. And it's just to, just to mention that. Okay. Okay, so anyway, yeah, that's, that's the whole presentation. I hope I covered everything. <laughs> <laughs>